Well, um, hello, everyone, dear colleagues, dear participants. Welcome to the European Distance Learning Week, third in a row, hosted by European Distance Learning Network Eden and in cooperation with United States Distance Learning Association, who is holding its National Distance Learning Week in parallel with the Eden event. My name is Sandra Kuchina, and I'm Eden Vice President for, for Open Professional Collaboration. If you are looking at location the map, you can see I'm coming from Zagreb. So for a whole week, we will run sessions, webinars on different topics related to the open and distance education. Distance education has evolved into, into an accepted way of learning. Today, new technologies have transformed students into mobile learners, enabled those uh, who uh, non-traditional students to have the opportunity to learn, as well as those of the lower socioeconomic status uh, to participate. Workplace today demand continuous learning, and even our children are introduced to technologies before entering the classroom. More valuable opportunities for our progress path are made possible through distance learning today. So during this week, we will open a number of topics related to the open and distance education. We brought together professionals and practitioners for discussion and sharing of experience and know-how. Daily during this week, we'll be hosting webinars at 13 hours Central Eastern Time, expect to, except today, as we have uh, colleagues from USA, so uh, we start a little later. So just let me, at the beginning, present the sessions which we are, which we'll have uh, during this week. So today. We start with introductionary panel into this week, discussing distance education, remembering the past, reflecting on present, and foresighting the future. On Tuesday, we will be discussing non-formal and formal education, recognition and credentializing of learning, and try to answer the question, are we arriving to the new era of education? One that is more focusing on informal learning, non-formal learning, and micro-credentials micro instead of traditional bachelor and master degrees. So join Ulf Daniel Ellers and his presenters on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we will present some case studies of innovative education, tackling digital literacies for higher education teachers, evaluation in distance education designing pathways, and student challenges into virtual mobility, mobility with Mark Nichols as the moderator. On Thursday, we have very important issues of quality insurance in regard to higher education and reflection to the paper on considerations for quality assurance of e-learning provisions by European Association Quality Assurance in high, Higher Education. And on Friday, we conclude the week with very important topic and panel discussion with uh, uh, Wim van Pettigen as a moderator on topic of Eden support to PhD students and research. We have just finished the Eden research workshop in Barcelona, and we are still high with emotions and impressions uh, about it. We had really good PhD symposium there. So our young researchers are drivers for change and it is our duty to help them and support them in achieving their goals and find the mutual agreement and understanding. So Eden is very strong about this point. Besides these uh, main sessions, we have contributions from the uh, other uh, Eden community members. As you can see, today we have already started in the morning with the session on topic of open education, what now? with Alistair Kriermann and uh, Catherine Cronin and Martin Weller. It was really good discussion, and recording can be seen on Eden web pages. On Wednesday, we are having a topic of virtual reality with uh, three ladies, uh, Susan Aldrich, Marcy Powell, and Diana Andone, and then with moderation of Steele Wheeler. And on Thursday, we have topic of new learning spaces for learning intense, intensive society, which is leading Elena Calderola from University of Pavia. Both these sessions on Wednesday and Thursday are starting at uh, 
15 uh, 30 uh, central eastern time so let me go back to our today's session let me focus on today's topic we will discuss with distinguished experts recent developments on open and distance education looking at it from different perspectives personal professional public private establishment regional from open and blended education perspective it is said that technology have been core to the nature and organization of learning and teaching for millennia. What tools are to use today for distance education? What are the trends? When we look at the future, what we can foresee and what are the challenges? As just only a few of the questions we will be talking about today. And let me present you today's panelists. First, Irina Volungvecina. Director of Innovative Studies Institute at the Vitatus Magnus University, Lithuania, and Eden President. She has established the National Network for Distance and E-Learning uh, in Lithuania, and then Lithuania Distance and E-Learning Association. Uh, Morten Paulsen, Acting Secretary General at International Council for Open and Distance Education, and former Eden President. He is also CEO of Nordic Open Online Academy, which has been established in 2012. Morten is also professor of online education. Then, Pat Casella, the president of United States Distance Learning Association. His uh, current focus is on distance digital learning initiatives with K-12 high education and healthcare industry, as well as the training and telepresence in corporate enterprise market. He is also president of EPC Video, a technology consulting firm based in Florida. Dean Hawk, a board member uh, of USDLA. Dean has over 40 years of progressively responsible and visionary leadership roles in higher education, communication, and e-learning throughout the United States and the United Arab Emirates. He is serving as managing partner of Ed Alliance Group, a higher education consulting firm. And also, in, two, in 1998, he co-founded the Connected Learning Network, a comprehensive provider of e-learning services for educational community in USA and Europe. Steffi Videra, Managing Director of Bavarian Virtual University, institution which was established in 2000 as a network organization of universities and universities of applied sciences in Bavaria, with primary goal to improve studying conditions for the growing number of students who require flexibility both in terms of time and place. Today, this network has about 31 member universities with over 385,000 students. And last but not least, our dear colleague Claudio Dondi, Senior Expert in Education and Training, Eden Senior Fellow, Claudia was also Vice President uh, of Eden from 2001 to 2006, and he also uh, directed several Europe European ob observatory projects on impact of ICT on education practices, policies, and research. Since, since 2013, he has been working internationally as an independent education expert based in Brussels. So I think that... Um, we have people from all over the world with uh, similar uh, ideas and uh, views, but uh, from different backgrounds. And uh, I think that uh, involving all of them will bring uh, discussion and presentation today even more interesting and actual. So I'll open the final, uh, panel and give the floor to Irina, to our Eden president, who will have introductionary statement and after her, we'll follow other panelists. So, Irina, please, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sandra. And I see the, the slides are in progress. Uh, first of all, I'm really very happy to see that this is the third European Distance Learning Week that actually was started after successful initiative in the States. Uh, uh, USDLA uh, organized uh, the National Distance Learning Week and we therefore 
to harmonize the dates so that come in parallel to this week. I'm very happy to see here Pat and Dean, the president and the chair member. So uh, also Dean, uh, thank you very much for joining in the early morning and also enriching the global perspective on the map. So I will be brief uh, with the slides uh, uh, highlighting the developments, mainly of course from Europe because of uh, European distance learning week perspective. And I hope uh, that you, with your statements, will enrich it further on uh, from the panelists uh, uh, on behalf of different regions. So uh, to open up, I would highlight uh, the following statement that preconditions uh, have been established and supported by European education policy for open discussion on the mainstreaming of innovations in learning and teaching. Open as a focus point has been used in Europe since um, a decade already, and it became also a tool for quality assurance in education, because openness and transparency turned out to be very important for European way of enriching the quality. New learning and teaching schemes are in need uh, for new types of assessment, recognition and certification of learning, despite of the fact that we have lots of projects, initiatives uh, that have been implemented already. We need learning and teaching schemes that are up to date with the developments. And innovations in ODL are met with a classical theory of development of innovation. Therefore, it is also the time to reinvestigate uh, whether we need a new approach and more interdisciplinary, more innovative approach towards something that is old, recognized, and we call it classical. EDEN has a mandate in Delta Group. Uh, it is a working group on ET, Education and Training 2020, on digital education in learning, teaching, and assessment. And this is the second group, continuing from previous group, addressing main concrete issues that they call uh, from uh, Education and Training 2020 Joint Report. You see them listed here, so mainly they address digital competences at all levels of learning, transparency, quality assurance, validation and recognition as a part of openness, I would argue. Uh, promoting the use of ICT and boosting availability on, and quality of open and digital educational resources and pedagogies. Pedagogies stand in the right position, I think, in this new mandate, and uh, this position is very promising, I should say. Uh, through exchange of good practices, topics, and peer learning uh, activities, we already identify that understanding the focus and practices are very diverse in European member states. Therefore, we think we need more of analysis of trends and foresight and dissemination of best practices, but also unsuccessful practices is very important for every member state. So I think fine-tuning on understanding, establishing of common understanding, and then incubating, experimenting new practices um, is the focus of this Delta mandate. Even uh, brought the proposals as contribution to digital action uh, plan, uh, which are to meet the following objective. To ensure networking and open professional collaboration of innovators, teachers, trainers, academics, and professionals with aim to mainstream digital transformation in education. And we selected two uh, focuses. Uh, one, uh, by experimentation, piloting, and sharing best practices of application of digital technology for teaching and learning. And the second, developing digital competence and skills uh, of teachers and learners. If you observe uh, these statements, I think you can identify that the position of our network is not to suggest a solution, but uh, to work with members, to work with member states in Europe, and to identify practices, success, successful and unsuccessful stories, in order that we can learn from each other. Of course, we made the more aggressive, if I may say so, proposal. Uh, I, I'm not going to read through them, but even established already quite uh, successful actions for both propo propositions. 
but uh, I will leave this for later record and maybe discussion. Now, uh, after Barcelona Research Workshop, we identified that even members as organization, as organizations and researchers already have some um, statements and proposals towards personalized guidance and support for learning which is one of the topics actually addressed recently also about, by Del, uh, Delta Mandate. So the statements can be summarized in four areas. One, personalization and adaptive teaching result in a productive combination of teacher support and students' particular needs and reinforcing students' attitudes. So it works as a positive development towards uh, teachers and students. Open education is a second item under personalized guidance and it is towards production and use of OER and we also have another line which is not in the slide but it is mentioned like OER pedagogies. So collaborative, flexible, sharing nature of social network environments as a poten potential learning context should be embedded and developed in organizations in order to work on innovative and flexible pedagogies. The third would be that teaching should integrate learners' differences, interests and needs, competences and digital technology potential and would, would have to shift towards more participatory pedagogy, supporting diversity of communication modes and learning communities. I must confess this is one of the greatest challenges observed in Europe because uh, organizations, higher education institutions, schools, that they are not ready for that in terms of their quite rigid administrative solutions still in, in place. Formative assessment and feedback, uh, the final statement uh, from this topic, uh, says that actually we have to look more at iterative uh, approaches and reinforce teacher learning dialogue through different channels in network environments enhancing learning. We have a summary and maybe also elaboration of those statements announced in even President's blog and other resources recently disseminated through even channels. So in parallel sessions, keynotes and presentations, we see the developments of open and distance learning in concrete uh, let's say, research towards personalized guidance and support for learning in the following topics. So you see the topics, you can identify them. I'm sure I'm not, uh, not very European, but more global ones. And I'm not going to read through them. So uh, our next um, and current contribution in uh, October, November session is European Distance Learning Week. As you can see, if we gather the needs from the bottom, from the member states, uh, from sorry, from the members of Eden, uh, I highlighted uh, the following uh, topics here in the slides that you already heard from the presentation by Santa, and this is ODL development. Also in the topics, uh, one of the major interests is to see how topics evolve and develop. Then formal and formal education, innovative education case study. A presentation, quality assurance for e-learning, and support to PhD students and uh, researchers. So uh, if we look at the topics that we discussed in Open Education Week 2018, we have challenges for quality of OER, grassroots of open educators at work, and discussions on how to promote academic integrity in online education. So this is a very a brief summary because we can't allow a broader one today uh, on how we observe the developments of ODL in Europe this year. And my conclusive statements are that ODL topics evolve as rapid as ever. ODL changed mainstream education in Europe towards much more flexible, accessible and equitable mode. Openness made great tribute to the quality of teaching and learning in Europe. Practices exist, but impact should be better communicated, and we already think on how Eden could work on that even better. And research became the priority, but we should be very 
accurate about the gap because the gap increases between the high frontier research and uh, mainstream uh, education practices. So this is also something that we already talk uh, with the policymakers and uh, in Delta Group on how to reduce the gap. Thank you very much for your attention. That I think is all of my time. And Sandra, I yeah. the floor. Irina, thank you. Uh, we will pose the questions after we have all introductionary statements. So um, I would like to invite Pat uh, now to, to give uh, the statement from the perspective of uh, USDLA. Uh, maybe also to, to share with, with us um, what do you think are the most important topics, issues at the moment regarding distance and on online education in, in America from, from your point of view? So please, Pat, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sandra. Good morning, everyone. Just waiting for the slides to load here for a second. Um, but, uh, you know, in response to Irina, great, great opening, Irina, that was fantastic. A lot of similarities between both Eden and uh, the United States Distance Learning Association. A lot of the same challenges. Um, communication and best practices. I think the, the, the more and more we can get our communities together to share those best practices, the better we're all going to be. Um, and especially as we come together across the, the, the globe, not just the United States doing its thing and the other countries doing their things. I think there's tremendous value in, in everybody coming together. So a little bit of an introduction on the United States Distance Learning Association. Let's see if I can get my slides to go here. I'm trying. Oh, there we go. We were on the back side. I've got to come back to the first one. Okay. So, um, you know, our, our mantra, what we do when we introduce United States Distance Learning Association, we really like to promote the benefit of it, it truly is a family. Um, when I attend the different events, especially our national conference each year, that's the one comment I hear from all the attendees over and over again. They really enjoy coming to the conference because they really feel it's a family environment rather than they're just one out of you know 10,000 folks at, at a traditional conference that might get too big. But we focus on both distance and the digital learning aspects. Um, you know, distance learning being in our, in our DNA as, as USDLA, but also the digital learning piece of it and how it has changed um, since we were founded back in 1987. You know, we're going back more than 30 years ago. And at that time, technology was just really starting to come into its own for uh, the video conferencing market. And Dean probably remembers, you know, I know we've both been around the industry for a long time. Uh, back then, you know, it was pretty difficult to conduct a real high-quality video conference. What we're doing today would have been virtually impossible, obviously, not to mention the computers wouldn't um, support it, but just the technology cost alone would be astronomical. It wouldn't be available for the, for the masses. Um, so, you know, we fast forward to where we are today, and our mission still stands to be as strong as it was back then to really help support the uh, development and the application of distance and digital learning, uh, education and training by uniting, uh, not only when we say learners around the world, talking about both those on the receiving side as well as those on the creation side. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a whole community of folks um, and taking a look at our constituencies you can see um, it's not just one particular vertical. Most folks would, would traditionally associate distance learning with the higher education constituency. Um, and we do have a pretty high ratio of members uh, that are in the higher education, but also from uh, pre-K to K through 12. So you're talking in your, your elementary, your middles, and your high schools, as we call them in the United States. Homeschooling is certainly coming up and becoming rather strong. A lot of folks are deciding to school their, their uh, child, children at home. And we have to be prepared to be able to provide those resources for, for that particular uh, set, of, uh, set of folks. Corporate training 
very, very important. And it is using the same principles of digital and distance learning. Government, military, telehealth is exploding in the United States. It's another one of those vertical applications that's been around for a long, long time. And the technology with being able to not have specialized platforms to conduct telehealth, um, where back in the days, you know, it might be just one big video conferencing system that could cost fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. Now there's so many different um, technologies that we can do this right on our own computer platforms like we're doing right now. Uh, for some reason, I slide switched back, but let's get back here for a second. Here's our members. Our members uh, go across educators and trainers, instructional designers, media experts, uh, as well as on the technical side. We have the administrators who are taking care of putting the systems together. Then there's content producers, policy makers, um, learners, as, as leaders as far as in the digital and distance learning. A lot of different members. It's one of the values of our association to bring all these folks together uh, through a series of, of different events. Our leadership, we have a board of directors that actually oversees the, uh, whoop, I keep, keeps getting jumped up here, but we have a board of directors that keep um, uh, on top of, I don't know what's happening here, Sandra, I'm fighting my slide. Somebody keeps taking them back. Uh, here we go. Let's see if it just stays there. Hands off. So uh, we are headquartered in Washington, D.C. We have an executive committee that oversees the association. We have several standing committees that help with various uh, functions that we put on everywhere from events to awards to membership. Dean heading up our global partners, a uh, very, very important committee. We have an advisory board, which uh, this year we, we have taken on several members, just USDLA members that we've asked do you want to get more involved with the association? And we brought them into the advisory board. And that has really helped us because we ended up with uh, folks from all different areas and constituencies and expertise that we can then bring into our different committees. Uh, our sponsors obviously help us out, event volunteers as well. Taking a look at, let's see where I'm going to get to the next one here. Just a quick view of our leadership. Uh, again, I'm the current president of the association, but how we work this is we have a very seamless uh, transition strategy where we have a past president, current president, future president working hand in hand. So at any point in time, the three of us are working very strongly together to make sure there's a very seamless transition with the association. Janet Major will be our new president in 2019. Ken Kahn was our past president. Uh, last year in 2017. And Reggie Smith is our new executive director. For those of you who have been familiar with USDLA over the years, John Flores was our executive director for many years. And John decided to uh, step aside this year and he is actually running for US Senate in Massachusetts and the states. So uh, in the Cape Cod area. So John, he, he did a great job keeping us together. And now we have Reggie to carry that torch uh, and help execute upon the desires of the board uh, as an association. Quick list of benefits. Uh, member networking is by far one of the biggest benefits for our membership. Uh, updates, we really try to keep up to date on what's happening in the digital and distance learning world and disseminate that information to our members through newsletters, special events, obviously this week with National Distance Learning Week, our national conference, which will be uh, next May in Nashville, Tennessee. Access to industry leaders, uh, best practice webinars, you know, the whole list here, you know, uh, representation in the uh, national legislative. So there's a, there's a good amount of benefits for our members. Just wanted to shout out and thank our sponsors for National Distance Learning Week this year. Uh, Drexel University Online, Corporate Learning Week, and uh, of course Blackboard, who has been a long-standing partner of ours for National Distance Learning Week. Uh, thank you. Without you as our sponsors, it's very difficult to pull off these events. 
We are doing a special for membership during National Distance Learning Week from today on through Friday. There is a discount code and our memberships uh, are all discounted. Everything from our individual memberships to our student memberships and our nonprofit and for-profit. So uh, if anybody is, is so uh, inclined to join, we have that discount available for this week. I wanted to point out a really important event um, when we talk about uh, distance learning is IFWE, uh, the International Forum for Women in E-Learning. It is a USDLA presented event. We do it only every two years. We typically cap the attendee list at 100. And as of yesterday, I think we're at 90. So we have 10 additional slots. Uh, the gals that run this event, um, Darcy Harding, uh, Rhonda Blackburn, and Janet Major, all three on the chair, they've done a fantastic job of pulling this off and bringing together uh, our women in e-learning and having them share their best practices uh, amongst themselves. Uh, a very um, I haven't been to one because they tend to not allow the men over there, although I've offered many times. But I understand it is a fantastic event. And then our call for awards for our national conference, we have uh, that open right now. So if you have an award that you would like to submit for best practices within distance learning, there is that link right there at the USDLA website slash awards. You could go there and um, you're able to see all the different categories that you could submit an award for. And then our award committee will be evaluating those uh, upon the, the new year. And we will be presenting those awards at our 2019 conference, which my little promotion down there, it is will be in Nashville at the Hilton Nashville Airport on uh, May 20th through May 22nd. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Sandra. And I want to thank everybody for uh, allowing uh, myself and my colleague, Dean Hook, to participate on the, uh, uh, the European Distance Learning Week. Uh, thank you, Pat. We had uh, little delays, but uh, we, we got it all. Uh, uh, so uh, now I'll turn to, to, to Dean. Um, Dean, can you share with us your introductionary statement? Can you hear me, Dean? We cannot hear you. Please check if your mic is open. We can't hear you. Check. One, two, three. There we go. Thank you. Yes, the um, where I think all of us are having a bit of a bandwidth issue. Um, a quick introduction. My name is Dean Hoke, and I have been involved in one form or another in distance education since the early 1980s. Um, I served in what is called in the United States public broadcasting, educational television. As a matter of fact, our station was established in 1957 as a classroom teaching tool to teach Spanish in Louisville, Kentucky, in which they had a, uh, by the way, good ratings. They had 90,000 students watching those television shows. So video has always been an important part. And also the history of distance learning comes back besides the, um, the sense of using mail to do degrees and things like that. But it also goes as far back as television with the concept of master teacher particularly when you did not have the, uh, the number of faculty that was required to be able to teach certain subjects. Um, as time has evolved, we've seen all kinds of different things. And for me, it was first in public broadcasting. And where I served in Louisville, Kentucky, in Texas, where we did telecourses uh, across the uh, state of Texas to Alaska in which uh, we were offering degrees through the University of Alaska in overnight. And that was in the early days of digital uh, satellites. As it has evolved, um, we've seen this start in elementary and secondary schools. 
We have seen it now starting to evolve very much into the higher education sector, which is our primary um, membership group in the United States Distance Learning Association. As Pat clearly articulated that we have a, um, the association has a combination of K-12 primary, secondary uh, school systems and teachers, but we also have corporates, but still the largest majority are higher education, uh, teachers, uh, educational technologists, faculty that are teaching every day, and that's where I'd like to focus because in my current role uh, as a consultant both in the United States and in the Middle East, uh, this is an area of interest to me. In terms of distance education in all forms in higher education, ranging from blended to purely online, it's now moved from, I wonder if this will work, and the fright factor that I think many faculty members had when this all began, to now an accepted practice, certainly in the United States, and I suspect with our European colleagues as well. The numbers of people that are taking some form of distance education has grown rapidly over the past 15 years. And in the United States, in higher education, we have 20 million students taking courses anywhere from community college systems two year all the way through PhD. There are now, I believe, something in the range of 6 million students that are taking distance ed courses, at least one completely distance ed course. And almost all schools are using uh, some form of blended learning as a regular part of their classroom teaching. With that still in mind, though, it's interesting to note that there is still some resistance to distance ed and what that really means in the United States. And I think it has to do not with the students and, frankly, not as much with the administration, but with faculty at times. And what we see is still in most of the survey work that's been recently coming out that faculty still believe, and rightfully so to some degree, that face-to-face -face is still a more effective style of doing teaching as opposed to online. I think that may have to do as much with the age factor of the students, and it may have to do, quite frankly, with the age factor of the faculty members who had not been taught that way themselves. This survey that I've been looking at over the weekend from Inside Higher Education and the Gallup Poll, which just was recently released, shows that the acceptance rate in saying, you know, distance ed is working and it's an effective teaching tool and it's effective as face-to-face -face, is growing. That, matter of fact, these days over 44% of faculty have taught some online course. And once they do, there seems to be a bit of this revelation. There's always been the intrepidation about, is this, some think it's too easy, some think it's too tough. I think probably one of the key issues has been training, quite frankly, and being comfortable with training and understanding system and understanding that this is merely a teaching tool more than anything else. And I think people have a tendency to forget about that. But once a teacher, once an instructor or a professor does it, and they kind of get through the first semester, kind of like first-year freshmen, they become much more comfortable with the idea and more and more become inquisitive and try to find ways to improve how they do their online teaching. When they do, there's a higher level of acceptance and I believe also a more effectiveness, quite frankly. Um, just to give you a sense, as I said, 44% of the instructors in the United States have taught an online course to show you how fast the rapid growth has been. In 2013, just five years ago, it was only 30%. That trend, I think, will continue to grow. I think we will see us cross the 50% line within the next year or two and continue to grow. It is a reality, and I think 
there is less resistance to it and acceptance in trying to find ways to use it better. Most say that once they've gone through the experience in higher education of teaching, they are saying that their technique seems to improve because they're having to do it a new way. And they learn new ways of communicating in terms of their students. In a sense, maybe it's less lecture. And it's more about um, the interaction between students and faculty. We see more and more of that. They learn how to um, give you an example. Back in the late 1990s, one of the things we noticed when I was working in distance ed was that faculty members were overwhelmed who were first doing it because of the Q&As that they were getting. All of a sudden, students that I used to call backbenchers who never asked a question in the classroom started asking questions because they could with somewhat of an anonymous point of view. And when they did, all of a sudden, they were somewhat enabled. They, they felt like they could ask questions without all of a sudden feeling like they were the, the kid who was asking the stupid question. And in some ways, it caught faculty off guard. We're still going through that evolution. And one of the things I think faculty learns with this is once they get past that, who are all these people that are asking these questions? They begin finding ways to organize it, to be able to respond to it, and be able to adapt teaching style to those questions. And I think that's some of what we're seeing in terms of the survey. And again, a kind of a natural evolution as to what is happening. And every time a person teaches a course, they find new ways to do things. The, um, the other side that we're seeing in terms of the United States, and I suspect elsewhere, is that one of the last groups, even though they were very much involved in establishing learning management systems, et cetera, has been that online degrees, particularly at the master's and doctoral level, are now becoming the norm. And this is particularly true in the tier ones that we're seeing. We have noticed that the medium and small schools in terms of marketing, had been pushing more and more for advanced degrees that they could do online. The MBA example, I think, is the one that most of us realize. But also in terms of education and nursing, in terms of masters, not the practitioner side, but the theoretician side. So now, for example, I live in the state of Indiana. And I'll use two examples. Indiana University, while they were um, an innovator, in terms of doing uh, learning management platforms with Angel. Um, and they were one of the places with their skunk works that developed that. They had been reluctant to do their advanced degrees online, purely online, or with minimal use of face to face. Now we're seeing doctoral programs come out of Indiana University for the first time in the past two years. The other major school here in the state of Indiana is Purdue. And Purdue may be the most interesting and somewhat controversial one of the group. Purdue, which is a widely recognized top 100, top 150 in the world school, who has always been known for engineering, as well as master's programs in business, has moved into a new area. And that has been, I think most of you know Kaplan. Uh, university, which was a for-profit school, fully accredited, but still one of the, the classic for-profits, which there's always been a certain creative tension between the for-profit industry and the non-profit. Purdue acquired Kaplan in early 2018, in which was groundbreaking and somewhat unexpected. Uh, the accreditation groups here in the United States, after a very thorough review, have approved the acquisition and that the degree. Purdue then proceeded to rebrand the Kaplan degree. It's now called Purdue Global, and a major advertising campaign has begun. The president of Purdue, who is the former governor of Indiana but has always been involved in education, a gentleman by the name of Mitch Daniels, has um, justified this and been an advocate 
based on the thought that we needed to find new ways to provide education. We needed to find it for people within the state of Indiana at a more affordable price, and particularly for non-traditional students. And also that his core belief is that distance ed could be done effectively as classroom. And he has gone forward with this. And while there have been a number of people who have said, I don't know about this, I think we are going to see this as the beginning of a trend for some of the larger universities that will look at this and they've watched the trend-setting group. They're going to watch them to see if they succeed or fail. But I think we will see here in the very near future others going down this path, possibly through the acquisition mode, which, again, we've all seen in terms of other learning management type of systems. I think this is just a part of the trend within the higher education industry. Doesn't mean there'll be one master school, but I think we're going to find new ways that things are going to be done. And with that, I'm going to stop here. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions you all may Thank have. you, Dean, Thank indeed. You. Um, it was really great to hear. Um, you have such a great experience to, to hear how it was before and, and also on the trends. So I'm sure we will get back together discussing it further. Um, let's now move on to the next panelist. Uh, Martin, uh, are you ready? Can you present? Mark, Martin? This is, yes, this is can Martin. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. So please, floor is yours. That's good. Uh, thank you, Sandra. I have a uh, unstable connection, so I will not use video if that's okay with you. Um, their, their colleagues, their friends, uh, I will be very short uh, today, and I hope that you hear me. Um, I am connecting from the ICDE office in Oslo. And I started working as uh, Secretary General of ICDE this summer. And uh, you probably know the organization and that we are celebrating our 80th anniversary this year. Uh, we now have 191 member institutions around the world representing all continents. And it has been a very interesting challenge to learn uh, about the organization and all our members. Uh, I see in the chat that at least some of you hear me fine, so I, I will go on. Um, the last few years, I've been uh, working, setting up my own online school called Campus Noah. And that has been a very interesting challenge, being an uh, entrepreneur. Uh, in my adult years. And as in addition to that, I'm also teaching master students in Norway about online education. So um, uh, that is an interesting variety of activities. And um, I also, as you probably many of you know, was a former president of Eden. Uh, since I only have a few minutes uh, and the connection might not be that good, I decided to focus on just one uh, issue this time, and it is the flexibility of time. And I have always been really fascinated about how uh, we can make distance and online education as flexible as possible uh, with regard to time. And uh, if you go on to the next slide now, Sandra, um, it is so that when I was teaching my master students uh, about uh, e-learning uh, the last few years, I have asked them the question, do you prefer linear TV or streaming TV? And uh, somewhere between 80 and 90% say that they prefer, 
pr preferred streaming TV like, uh, for example, Netflix and that kind of thing, when they can see as much TV they want at the time they want, and then they can fast forward and they can pause and they can see all seasons at the same time. So then I ask them, would you prefer linear education or streaming education? And then they start to look at each other, kind of not understanding what I'm asking about because this is a con it's a new concept for them. But that is starting many times a very interesting discussion, thinking how could education be if they use the metaphor of streaming television. And then I would like to discuss with people what if digital natives prefer streaming TV and streaming education? What will the results be for that regarding the flexibility that I really, really would like to have in distance education? And what about if you could start study whenever it suits you? What if you can take all the time you need to finish the course or the program? What if you could change the sequence of the lessons as, it prefer, as if you prefer it? And what if you could study on fast forward going much quicker than uh, the university wants you to study? What if you could learn at your own pace, have a vacation whenever you want, and also decide yourself one when you want to do uh, the exams? That are some of the issues that comes up when uh, we start to discuss the flexibility of time. And if you could go on to the next slide, Sandra. And if you look around, uh, most traditional education is very linear. It is uh, developed for the university, not for the flexibility of the students. And my worry is that traditional distance education institutions were very focused on the flexibility of time. But now, when mainstream education starts to uh, offer more and more uh, online and distance education in competition with the traditional distance education institutions, then it seems to me that distance education is becoming less flexible than it used to be. And that worries me. And uh, that is uh, an issue that I would like to discuss with you or answer question about. So I think I will uh, stop there and I hope you could hear me, even though the connection might not be that good. So I'll give it over to you, Sandra. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Martin. The connection was very good, so we could, he could hear you quite clearly. Just a commenting when you're talking about t streaming TV, for me it's like going to the shopping mall. I prefer that that uh, uh, way uh, because I like to choose what I want, uh, what time I want. Uh, so uh, TV or shopping, it's similar. Okay, but thank you. Um, and now um, I'll ask uh, Steffi uh, to present uh, her introductionary five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Sandra, and good afternoon to everyone here. Um, first of all, I want to introduce to you just a little bit uh, the VHB, Virtuelle Hochschule Bayern, the Bern Virtual University. And uh, first of all, I have to apologize because uh, the Bavarian Virtual University set up in the year 2000 is not a university but a network organization of uh, universities and universities of applied sciences in Bavaria. 
Um, and our main task is to complete the digital offerings of our universities. Uh, of 31 member universities, you mentioned it, Sandra, before. So we have more than 400 professors and university teachers involved in course developments. We have, at the moment, 520 courses in operation in 15 different uh, subject groups. Uh, should, should I by myself? So do you see when I flip the slides? Yeah? You know, on the second slide, uh, slide, okay. And 100 courses currently in development and 975 learning units in development. This is a new field of area. Uh, because in the last 17 years, uh, the Bavarian Virtual University offered only complete online courses um, in the terms of the semesters, and now we have two new fields, uh, fields of activity, Smart Fahabe with the smaller learning unities, units and uh, the open Fahabe. And the very important uh, Think about the VHB um, is all these offerings are for the use across the universities, and uh, so I think the basic idea of digitization and the basic idea of internet is sharing, sharing of content, and so the basic idea of the BVU is sharing as well, and so this fits just digitization and VHB. And uh, you, yesterday or that, some, yes, yesterday, Sandra, you asked me to um, say just a few words about governance and finance of the Bavarian, uh, the Bavarian Virtual University. And so I just want to um, tell you something about the organizational structure. I don't have slides, uh, but I just want to mention it. It's a network organization under the control of the Bavarian Ministry of Science and Arts. And this is very important because we are a mix of uh, a bottom-up idea. The idea of the BVU is an idea of the universities. It's a bottom-up idea. And all the universities are involved. And they have uh, a commissioner in the members' assembly. And the members' assembly um, is um, the part we discuss and decide all the main issues uh, about the BBU. And the members' assembly also elects a program committee and uh, a steering committee. The program committee, eight members, uh, they advise um, all the, the issues about the program and about the quality management of the Bavarian, uh, Bavarian Virtual University uh, for the steering committee and the steering committee, uh, one president and two vice presidents, they, um, they have to decide everything about our programs and about our funding. And here in the office in Bamberg, we are 30 persons just to support our universities, administration, technical experts, and project managers. And um, I think the bottom-up idea fits very good to something which is a little bit in contrast to it, because um, we have uh, also the aspect of obligation. All the state universities in Bavaria have the obligation to be a member university, but they have always the free choice to accept a course as a part of their degree programs because of the freedom of the research and teaching at the universities. And so I think the recipe for success is exactly the mixture between voluntary and obligation plus funding. So we are a funding institution and uh, we fund and support uh, the course developments at the universities. So just around 90% of our budget goes directly back to the universities. And I think this is what, uh, what was very uh, successful the last years. 
and uh, if we now just uh, look, yes, 60,000 uh, students doesn't sound a lot if you compare it to the U.S. market of 6 million students, but Bavaria is very, very small compared to your country. Um, and so we are, yes, we think it's quite okay for uh, German um, relations. And um, so what I mentioned before, I don't want to um, say it again, but three lines of funding, complete online courses, and smart uh, VHB learning material for blended learning uh, on the micro level, which means uh, to enhance and enrich the classroom teaching with digital materials uh, and stored in a repository and open VHB, we just starting in the next year with open offerings and open courses for an interested uh, public, also uh, for uh, future students who want to bridge knowledge gaps uh, before they start studying, or for migrants and, uh, yes, for, for all the interested uh, public, and it's free, free of charge. So we are now starting with more openness. <laughs> As to say. So, and now, Sandra, stop me if it's too early for the statements because I think you wanted to do it at the end of the discussion. So I can continue, but I don't know if it really fits to your program. Well, uh, it's fine. We, we can do it uh, later, but maybe to, to, to give them now so we can discuss upon that uh, in, in, uh, in our questions. Uh, so I, I propose that you continue. Okay. So um, we were asked to to uh, think about statements about the future of uh, distance learning, and uh, I have uh, three very personal uh, statements, and uh, it's a very uh, subject uh, subjective subjective uh, meaning. The word of so statement number one is. Um, and uh, we mentioned it in different relations uh, before. The world of universities will change the campus. Campus goes digital and stays analog as well. Seems a little bit cryptic, but uh, I think um, we will have more transfer of knowledge, of theory, of content, uh, digital. And on the other side, the campus, the classroom teaching will change it will be more creative discussion spaces. We will have more workshops and more exchange of ideas between teachers and students. And so the world of digitization will change even the campus universities and even the face-to-face -face teaching at the universities. So. Statement number two is higher education overcomes borders and becomes international, multicultural, and hyper-flexible. So uh, today it's, um, so, or for example, uh, with the VHB, with the Bavarian Virtual University, um, you are able to hear a lecture at a university, you are not enrolled. And uh, you can collect ECTS and credit, credit points at a university of your choice. And so the world is going to be smaller and bigger at the same moment. And this, uh, everything with digitization, so without physical moving and without physical traveling, which is very important. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to talk about the global climate change, but we have to think about another way of traveling. We are now, this is the best example of what we are doing now. So we are together, but we are on our, uh, we are at home, so to say. And the statement number three is uh, there will be more transparency in education and a higher standard of quality. It was mentioned, I think, Irina, you talked about uh, quality or someone else. And uh, so we made the experience. We have um, a very elaborated quality management uh, in our network organization. So all the courses are uh, evaluated uh, by experts, technical experts, and experts concerning content. And this is something uh, teachers at the universities are not familiar with 
uh, usually or actually they are not used to be um, evaluated by experts they are used to be evaluated uh, by students this is where we are uh, where we are familiar with but uh, this is something very new and we made the experience that these quality management in distance learning influences even the face-to-face -face teaching and the classroom teaching so there will be a higher standard of quality and digitization means always to set standards and uh, so we can we have more the possibility to exchange really on a on a uh, level we can compare so these are my three statements and so I give back to Sandra and so do what you want with these statements. <laughs> okay, thank you, Seth. It was good. It was good. And now we come to Claudio to to conclude this introductionary part. Um, so Claudio, floor is yours. Good afternoon and good morning to the American friends. Uh, I'm very happy to be in such a company. Uh, and I feel very, very stimulated by what I heard that interacts uh, with my <laughs> funny task uh, to finalize the introduction. Um, when I started my activity in the 80s, uh, distance education was already anticipating uh, several, what I would call, modernity elements that we are talking about now. Uh, first of all, uh, flexibility of time, and of course flexibility of place, accessibility, personalization, recognition of learning, of previous learning achievement, and so openness to, without the need of formal credentialization, and of course uh, use of technology, the technology of that time that was already ICT, a different form of ICT from the one we have now. Uh, but uh, during uh, these uh, more than 30 years, uh, distance education gained uh, uh, more respectability by getting, and I, in this I, I would like to take a little bit Morton's uh, statement, uh, became a little bit more rigid, became a little bit more similar to mainstream education, also thanks uh, to quality assurance uh, procedures and criteria that, uh, that made this uh, more or less an obligation in order to be equally recognized as conventional education. I'm talking mostly about higher education. Now the paradox is that in the same time uh, conventional mainstream education have adopted uh, several solutions in order to become more flexible and more open. So some 15 years ago, we were expecting convergence. Now, the convergence is not yet there. Although we can see some, uh, some new creature, like a uh, relatively new creature, like the Bayern uh, Virtual University, that put together uh, a constituency of uh, mainstream institutions and the model that is uh, typical of higher, of uh, distance education. What happened is that uh, um, conventional mainstream education have adopted technology, but uh, this is not the merit of ODL. I'm sorry to disagree on a single point with Irina. It's the merit of technology spreading uh, in the society and so becoming an obligation also for education institutions. In fact, if we read the latest report for the, from the European University Association, it says uh, literally that uh, ICT and uh, th they call it digitally supported learning has been uh, adopted in a way or another by every higher education institution, but uh, it has uh, not uh, made mainstream. That means that in spite of recognizing that there are a lot of good things in, uh, in the ideas coming from distance education, mainstream education keeps a certain distance and adopts it as a sort of a parallel pathway of education. Now, 
My, my point of view on this uh, is that uh, uh, if uh, uh, the community of distance education that includes a lot of people that uh, have adopted technology and models of distance education also in conventional institutions uh, had so many good ideas and is uh, so uh, in line with the trends of society why aren't we a little bit more daring and don't take our challenge simply to broaden a little bit our niche? I mean, okay, six million students is a lot of students, but how many students don't follow distance education in the United States? 60,000 students in Bayern is a big number, but how many students are not in the virtual higher education in the same federal state? So I think really there is a, um, there is a challenge to, to come out a little bit, to be a little bit more daring and taking uh, um, in this also the last statements of, uh, made by Dean are, are in this direction. If uh, we see that we are adopting before the others many important things that are in the evolution of society, why shouldn't we have more influence on mainstream? Why shouldn't uh, we propose uh, our model not only for those who are not uh, comfortable in the conventional model, but as an element uh, of uh, modern education. Forget about distance uh, and uh, digital. Education needs to be personal, needs to be fitting on the needs uh, of individual learners. We all know it, we, we discuss it since 50 years uh, in research workshop. If you take the workshop uh, of Barcelona, where Alina, Irina was mentioning the session, these are all in our agenda, but not only in our community agenda, they are in the agenda of every learner who would like to learn comfortably and following her own interests and talents. Why isn't this applied in 80% of education that is still done as in the beginning of the 20th century when we are in the beginning of the next century. I think really there is the, a big issue there. And then maybe in the second part I will come back with uh, some other statement. But I would attract the attention on the challenge of having more influence and not just being happy because our niche is becoming a little bit bigger every year and uh, people are recognizing that we were right 30 years before. We were right in the sense that we adopted earlier some principles that are now becoming more accepted. But being accepted doesn't mean that they are actually applied in a widespread way in conventional education. And we have a role to play there. Thank you. Um, yeah, good, good uh, summarizing uh, the, the, the good topics. Uh, but. Um, just take from your your uh, point. Uh, so, where is this gap between uh, all of these possibilities of technologies and the mainstream education, who is aware of it but still have huge reluctance into acquiring and implementing them into educational process? So, where is this gap? What what is the issue? What where is the problem? Why do not we have so many teachers? who are willing to try new things, uh, why we uh, uh, still tackling with the, the, the number of students who do not take uh, uh, any kind of education, actually, uh, at, or, or, or if they take it only face-to-face -face education. Uh, uh, why are our higher education institution or all institutions have such huge reluctance in making changes to adapting to new needs of our learners and uh, and the society. So, can you recognize where why is this happening? I'm opening the floor to our presenters. So, uh, well, if you would like to to answer, please. Who is willing to start? Okay, Pat. I'll start, I'll start it. I'll start it out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've traveled around the country for the last 20 years. You know, meeting with educators. There is certainly, as Morton pointed out, there's a reluctance to change. Some of them, when you talk about just simple lecture capture, which to me is tremendously beneficial to go back and look at uh, a lesson that was taught 
and I might my notes might not have been up to par and I want to go and watch it again. Some instructors are very open to say, okay, go ahead and capture my lecture, but I'm not going to stream it live. Two different things. I'll let you record it. I'll let you play it back on demand. But I want you in my classroom, my physical classroom. Um, and that, that, that mentality has to change. Uh, I firmly agree. We're in a generation of learners that will learn at their own pace. Think of that flipped classroom model of, hey, I want to go and watch the content at my pace, and I want my instructor to be there to help answer my specific questions. Uh, and that's a big, big mindset shift for, for an instructor, uh, especially one, as Dean pointed out, um, not to be aged by it. But, you know, some of the instructors are a little bit older and they're a little bit more set in their ways and they just don't want to give it up. They don't want to try something different or change. Um, and I think that has to happen. And the way that has to happen, it really has to be at the top of the institution. There has to be a policy put in place that says this is the way we're going to go. Um, and uh, in the United States, it's a little tougher uh, to be, it's easier said than done because you have tenured professors and they'll say, well, no, it's my way or the highway. But uh, I think that we have to somehow break past that point um, and have them realize that, you know, this is a, a much different way of learning for these uh, students today. Steffi, you had, yeah. you raised your hand. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, we can have a higher level of acceptance uh, or we, are, we would be better accepted uh, if we can communicate the need and the benefit. So if people, teachers and students see the need uh, or they need uh, the benefit, it's better. And I think uh, a problem is or challenge is that you have on one side you have open digital offerings and this means a large unspecified target group and on the other side you have individualized more and more individualized education histories and so you you have to bring this together on one side a large target group and on the other side really like you said um, a, a really individual group which want to have their own offerings. And I think what we have to, as our communities, we have to lead students through the jungle of offerings because the internet is so huge and there, there is a lot. You can individualize your own education, but you have to find the right offerings. Thank you, Steffi. Irina, you raised the hand you want to add. So I think I would highlight three things. Uh, one thing, I agree that uh, we don't have uh, the offer, actually, that would uh, meet the needs of the society, the learners, uh, uh, that would join um, formal education. I agree with Claudio that the offer is very weak. I mean, we have uh, a lot of innovations now. Uh, we have different forms of curriculum opened and offered, but um, if we look at it uh, and if we analyze it from the perspective of formal, non-formal and informal, the majority goes for informal learning online, which is uncontrolled. Uh, then we have something for non-formal, which is not usually recognized in the formal education, and we have very few offers from formal education. Why? Um, I would also um, stand for higher education organizations and formal uh, education providers. In Europe, we are obsessed with several um, quality things, with the procurement, with the quality assessment. We have uh, uh, agencies working, you know, accrediting, checking. Um, evaluating the program every three or six years, which is an amazing workload for uh, academics. And you know, despite of the fact that we need innovations, at the same time we are overloaded with tasks on doing what we are already doing as, 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 as uh, staff and, and faculty, as you call it in the state. And another thing, you know, uh, technology-driven innovations um, pedagogy-driven innovations 
they come now in massive communication. We can imagine that leaders in ODL stand out and everybody is providing their offers, uh, innovations, research, uh, projects online, and accessibility of this massive type of offers also make the academia to decide in a responsible way. So by saying that we pick one and go deeper into one experiment and apply, I think it reflects a very normal uh, process of uh, higher education at school. Because we, we simply cannot manage, we choose a scalable way of adapting it and implementing. And um, sometimes I think we overdo with the emphasizing and um, um, highlighting uh, different, different innovations like we had with MOOCs, for example, in Europe. They're, they're absolutely different from what you have in the States. And I would say these are two different approaches. And you know, we pick up something and we put it into different contexts and different understanding, and then we play with it on a political level, on a formal education level, on a, and then people are at a loss. So I always feel the people who take them slowly. And I understand why it happens because I come from a university myself. But I wish to uh, develop uh, uh, a more rapid offer, but I think the reason behind is uh, the one that I share with you now. Thank you, Irina. Uh, Dean, but just before you start, uh, we have some questions in the chat, so please look at them uh, as well. And also, I want to say to the participants, we have the poll here with the yeah, questions. You can post your question in the poll as well. So, uh, Dean, please comment. Mike, Dean, we cannot hear you. There we go. Still have problems with technology. May have something to do with my age as well. <laughs> the um, the one thing I would I would bring up is I would worry less about the full professors in life, the older professors, people maybe more my age, about trying to convert them. I believe that this is somewhat generational. I also believe that while administrations can at times do top down. Reality is, in order for it to succeed, you are going to have to have faculty do buy-in with this, that they need to buy into the concept. Um, leadership is critical at the top, but that collaboration needs to happen at the faculty level. And furthermore, the one thing I have heard, at least in recent times, is not so much the fear, it is the issue of time, and that more support is needed for faculty members to help make things possible. I do believe there is interest in trying to evolve with all this. But also remember, most faculty members are not teachers like a K-12 teacher in terms of their training. They're learning through a different sort of way and teach in a different sort of way. So I would believe, again, just kind of going back to it, while top-down is um, important at a certain level, you have to have the buy-in and the collaboration from the faculty, and particularly the younger faculty in there, to take that type of leadership. Thank you, Dean. Um, so we have a question uh, from Alistair. Uh, many learners have no idea how to learn online and need lots of support to get started. How we can support this? Any, any volunteers to answer this question? Or maybe you can... Uh, Type it uh, in, in, in the chat. Uh, the next question is from Eba about quality. Why is always high demand on quality in online learning than in than more than in traditional courses at the campus? So uh, usually we do not have peer reviewing uh, on quality of, of courses in the campus, but we uh, ask for, for quality uh, of online uh, courses. There is a pro a cons there, and the the, the question is about um, 
Ignas asked about online learning in regards to European standards and gu guidelines for quality assurance in higher education. Higher education. How it, should it be pursued to have online and distance learning in some way covered in it? And in what way? Uh, so different different uh, 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 questions. Uh, so um, would you like to comment on any of these questions? Um, I'll take a stab at the online versus the on-site, you know, quality measurements. I think again because it's um, it's it's newer to a, to a degree, and I think there's still a um, kind of a belief out there that online learning is not as high of quality as when you're physically there on premise. I think there's still that uh, that stamina out there, um, that stigma, but. Um, you know, it should be it should be measured. I firmly believe it should be measured both ways, uh, for sure. And um, as time goes on, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the AI movement. That you know, uh, eventually, my opinion, uh, instructors to a large degree are their, their roles are going to change, and AI is going to have a big uh, play in that in the forms of robots. And it's, it's real if you haven't followed that movement and go and start doing a little bit of research on uh, what robots are capable of doing right this minute and what their role is going to be in the future. Uh, I think you're going to see instructors programming robots basically to act as themselves. And, um, you know, the, but the, back to that question, I really feel that it is because online is still considered not as good as traditional. And I think that's why there's a higher level of interrogation and quality measurement for the uh, for the online results. But personally, I would like to hear what my colleagues think. I think it should be measured equally, whether it's physical or online. Um, Claudio, maybe you would like to comment on this question of Ignaz, of Ignaz uh, about uh, online learning in regard to European standards and guidelines for quality insurance in higher education. Um, well, should it, I'm not sure I'm 100% updated. I know there was a significant uh, attempt uh, a couple of years ago to, to bring the issue of uh, technology and uh, open and distance learning uh, into the European standards and guidelines. As far as I know, the latest version of 2015 uh, doesn't contain any reference to it uh, with the based on the principle that uh, what applies to normal education also applies to uh, e-learning, let's say. Uh, nevertheless, I'm sure that EBA has worked on this uh, and uh, there are some developments, probably EBA is better than me in, uh, in giving you updates and answers on this. As far as I'm concerned, I, I really think there is a lot of uh, self-protection in the um, in the criteria that are used by quality assurance and accreditation agencies because uh, not so much in Europe but uh, especially in uh, in America distance education has been associated with commercial as opposed to public especially in southern America but also a little bit in northern America and uh, uh, public universities have felt the need to defend themselves uh, from uh, emerging uh, private, uh, to a large extent, distance education by setting standards uh, uh, for quality that only apply to, to present uh, higher education <laughs> and they cannot be achieved in any way by distance education. So uh, distance education is obliged to uh, to have uh, buildings uh, and number of permanent teachers uh, that are not functional to the business model just because they need accreditation. And, uh, and that is a, a dynamic that uh, honestly I think we should uh, definitely overcome in the 21st century. And, uh, and the state uh, that uh, although there is a, a clear need to defend a public good principle in education is not because uh, an offer of education is provided privately or by distance that it needs to be inferior to another. It may be less research intensive, 
but it really depends on what the learner are looking for. And, uh, and that is another issue, I think, that uh, for which uh, we, we, we should, as a community, uh, fight a little bit, because the next uh, edition of the standards and guidelines are open to technology-based uh, technology enhanced learning, not uh, rather resistant to it. But we tried several times in the past uh, with modest success, I have to say, even with FQL, as you may remember. Claudio Martin, you wanted to comment on this. Yes, thank you, Sandra. Uh, I have uh, several experiences from Norway now that I think are also seen in many other countries. It is related to when mainstream uh, institutions want to be more flexible they often uh, acquire, merge with, or buy smaller distance education institutions because they want to learn from the flexibility and the, the models and the pedagogy the smaller flexible institutions have. But what actually is happening is that uh, since the, the traditional institutions are uh, the big brothers they are uh, larger uh, more they have more money more resources then they start to uh, change uh, the flexible institutions into their model making uh, not use of the the good uh, experience the smaller institutions have for example we see a lot of institutions that have developed very good learning platforms or uh, made their learning platforms very well suited for distance education. And when they are merged with the larger institutions, they have to use the standard learning management system that the larger institution has. Uh, they have to adapt to the standards that the larger institution has. So I've seen a number of institutions that have had a lot of good experiences with dealing with distance education for many years, now being kind of swallowed and uh, more or less uh, stopped doing the good work they do because these uh, larger mainstream institutions kind of take them over and force their models on them. We are already exceeding our planned time, so we need uh, to conclude. Oh, all the discussion just started, actually, but uh, maybe um, to, sh to shortly summarize and, and, and conclude, um, to each of you with uh, one sentence uh, and uh, saying yes or no, uh, what is, in your opinion, is, uh, uh, is distance education is future of education? So yes, no, and why? In, in short, in short, uh, and uh, while you're thinking a little bit, I'll uh, put the poll uh, to so that people can um, uh, can uh, put their thoughts uh, uh, also uh, on on this uh, uh, webinar. What is their thought? Uh, they are leaving this webinar today. So, for panelists, is distance education future of education? Yes or no? And why do you think that? Who is going to be first? Pat, maybe you start. I, I think it's strong. Uh, I do think it might change a little bit. Um, I know a lot of people think distance learning, they always associated it with synchronous, you know, having a real-time aspect to it. I think they're going to see more and more of that uh, asynchronous combined with the synchronous. So there is going to be that piece of it, um, learning delivered at a far, delivered at a distance in, a, in an asynchronous manner uh, for learning the topic. But I think you're always going to have the synchronous piece for follow-up and asking questions and whatnot. And that's, that's where I see it really headed with, with that AI aspect uh, added to it. Thank you. Dean? What is your opinion? Inevitable and evolutionary. I believe that it is inevitable 
and it's evolutionary that what's going to happen with distance education. It is going to continue to happen. It is going to grow. It is somewhat a matter of time. And furthermore, that it will continue to be worldwide. But I also believe that faculty members will continue to exist, and they will be with us. They are just going to be a part of the process on how teaching is done. They're going to be a very big part. Thank you, Steffi. What is your? Thank you. So I think the future. I think we have a little bit later. So I think the future of distance learning is that we won't talk about distance learning anymore. We talk about education at all. I think both parts race, and I think that they come together more and more. And we do not have these differences between distance learning and uh, learning in a classroom. So I think this will be the world of education in the future time. Would you like to comment? Yes, please. Uh, I do believe in uh, online and distance education, uh, of course, and I really think it will be more global in the future. I did predict that uh, 30 years ago as well, but I, I really see that uh, the education across national borders is growing, and I think it will continue to do that. Thank you. Claudia? Well, uh, if you use your terms, I can say, yes, I believe distance education will be uh, education. But I think, in fact, we, we need the personal element made clear in order to to unite the two. And the personal education will be education. It will use technology, but in order to get to that point of uh, that Steffi is mentioning of getting to union, we need to be a little bit more daring. We said the many reasons why mainstream education is not adopting 100% uh, our approach. It's also a little bit uh, our uh, shyness in, uh, in showing how um, how uh, related to the future is the, is the innovation that we propose. We, we, in a sense, we have been too modest in staying in our, in our niche, in our niche that is going grow, uh, that is growing and growing, and we are satisfied and complacent in recognizing that the trends are there. But I think we should be also more organized and more daring in uh, selling within inverted brackets uh, the change that we have already experienced uh, to mainstream education. And Irina, to conclude uh, this uh, statement. I think, uh, I think uh, actually that flexible, open and online learning uh, will be the future. And I think it will be the reality uh, for the mainstream of the society. And uh, in my understanding, formal uh, education providers need to learn to recognize uh, flexible, open, and online learning. And uh, as if they prepare offers, that would be for the good. But I don't believe that uh, completely online learning in formal settings will dominate. And uh, I would argue for the possibility for the teacher to choose the best way uh, so that we don't count indicators in terms of other things but the teacher decision, but the teacher digital proficiency is a must. And flexibility, I am arguing against uh, standard uh, rigid solutions uh, for quality assurance. If they will continue, uh, teachers will not uh, uh, develop any of us at all. Thank you, Irina. And um, let me conclude this webinar. What I think is very important that uh, we do raise questions and discussion uh, about these topics. And this is why Eden and uh, organizations like USDLA and ISDE have important role 
uh, as I would say, uh, uh, leaders of, of uh, networking and communications and discussions on this topic, because only by discussing and collaboration we can make things change actually, because uh, people often miss understanding of things, and this is one of the major reasons why they are against something. So um, I wish to thank you all for participating today for a really good uh, discussion. Um, if we had more time, I think we will even have bigger uh, discussion and more questions, but I will conclude to this today uh, thanking you all. Um, we will post the recordings uh, of the session on our Eden web page, and maybe for the next year we continue where we stopped uh, in this uh, uh, webinar. So thank you again, uh, all of you panelists and the participants, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.